Brilliant. So today, um, this is a webinar by Cambridge Dream, and I am the founder of Cambridge Dream. I'm just trying to make my slides move. There we go. Um, so here I am, Laura Davis. I'm the founder and director of Cambridge Dream. I have a master's degree from Cambridge University, and we're known as the Cambridge family because my husband, my son, and my daughter-in-law are all Cambridge graduates. This is a picture of my son in the middle receiving his um, graduation certificate after six years studying medicine. So today I'm going to be talking about Oxbridge admissions, uh, summer opportunities both in Cambridge and more widely, what you can be doing in the summer to help prepare for your university applications and the scholarships that we're offering for GEM students. And all of this will be valuable for anyone who is aspiring to study at a competitive university not just Oxford or Cambridge, anywhere else in the UK or indeed worldwide. So the topics I'm going to cover, Oxbridge admissions and UCAS, eight ways to make your application stand out, some top tips for writing personal statements, performing well in interviews and doing well in admissions tests. All of these are very important for, for competitive universities. I will then share with you Cambridge Dreams, summer opportunities and the scholarships for GEM students. I'll also touch on coronavirus. I've added this on because I know it's very much front of mind for everyone at the moment. So I will give you an update from our perspective um, as to where we, we believe uh, we are with regard to the coronavirus and we'll have some questions and answers. If you want to make some notes or questions while I'm talking, put them into the chat and we'll have a look at those later. So which are the most competitive UK universities? It won't surprise you to know that uh, Cambridge and Oxford are by far uh, the top universities, if I can put it that way, the top ranking universities in the UK. And together they're known as Oxbridge. You've got Cambridge on the left here and Oxbridge on the right. The very famous Radcliffe camera, this round building. So let's, let's have a, a look at Oxbridge. Oxford and Cambridge, consistently in the top five world universities. Um, there are many, many different ranking tables um, and they all vary a little bit depending on what they're measuring. But certainly Oxford and Cambridge are very much in the, in the top world-class universities. Both over 800 years old, Oxford is actually a little bit older than Cambridge, and both known for the, the beautiful architecture, but also, of course, the amazing discoveries, inventions, the fantastic poetry and plays and books, uh, social science discoveries, philosophy, psychology, you name it, every walk of life, every field, um, there are some famous alumni and Nobel laureates who have studied or taught at Oxford and Cambridge. It is extremely competitive. The average success rate is one in five, and it's a little bit lower for international students, depending on where you're applying from and what subject you're applying for. It's a collegiate system. So that means that instead of applying to Oxford University or Cambridge University, you actually choose a college. <clears throat> so that's something you need to research. You need to look at the colleges and decide which one appeals most to you. Some are very old, some are quite new, some are very big and some are quite small. And some are right in the middle of the action, right in the middle of the, uh, the city and others a little bit further out. The college which I studied at was actually about two miles outside the centre of Cambridge and I chose it because it was a little bit more in the countryside. It had a lot more open space and uh, it, was, it was a very quiet place to, to get on with your studies. Each of the universities, Oxford and Cambridge, has about 12,000 undergraduate students and a similar number of postgraduate students, and they come from many, many, many different countries throughout the world. So whatever your nationality, you will find other students from your part of the world and other um, academic staff from that part of the world as well, because the, the teaching staff are also very, very international. Oxford and Cambridge are members of the Russell Group of Universities, and those are 24 uh, leading universities in the UK. That is the website if you want to go on and have a look, russellgroup.ac.uk, and you can look at every single one of those universities in great detail. Oxford and Cambridge are in there, but also, as I say, 22 other amazing universities all over the UK. 
England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, right the way from Aberdeen down to Southampton on the south coast of, of England. So you've got an enormous choice there. So let's get straight to it. What are the admissions tutors in these kinds of universities looking for? Well, as I touched on in my opening statements, uh, very much first on the list is the high examination grades. That is number one. Um, these are academic universities. They are looking at your academic achievements primarily, but they realise that you've got a long way to go. You're, you're still at school. You, you haven't peaked. Um, and so they're looking for your potential. And really the whole application process, the whole admissions um, process is about assessing your potential, where you are now, but also how much progress you're going to make uh, and how well you're going to perform when you leave school and move on to university. So that's what they're going to be looking for evidence of. You need to have a genuine interest in the subject you're applying for. So when you choose that subject, um, of course you want to choose a subject that you're doing well in, but also think about, am I going to really enjoy studying this subject solely for the next however many years it is, three, four, five, maybe six years? And uh, is it something that's going to enthuse me? Am I going to jump out of bed every morning? Absolutely keen to get to my studies. If you can't face that prospect, if you think actually that's not something I want to do, then think again, do some more research. Unlike the US where you have a couple of years where you'll be doing a whole range of core subjects before you pick your major, in the UK you have to pick your major right from the start. So you need to be sure it's a subject you're going to really enjoy. And that's something the universities are going to be testing you for in the application process. You also need to be able to think critically rather than recall facts. And this is particularly true for Oxford and Cambridge. I would say actually for all the leading universities in the US and other countries as well. And what universities mean by that is um, they realize that to pass examinations, you need to memorize a lot of information. and you, you use that to, to uh, answer the questions in the examinations. So they, they understand that you've got good memories, that you can uh, recall information, but what they're more interested in is, can you use your knowledge to go beyond that, to go beyond the school curriculum, the syllabus, and answer perhaps problems you haven't come across before, things that you haven't encountered before, can you apply the principles? Can you use your brain to make an educated guess? And that's really what the interview is all about. And I'm going to talk about some of this in, in more detail as I go through the webinar. But just to summarize all of that, universities are looking for students' academic potential. They're looking for real commitment to the subject. And that's particularly true if you're doing a vocational subject like medicine. <clears throat> you're going to be studying it for a long time, but you're also going to be making your career in that field. That could be true for engineering, for law, for many other subjects. So they're going to be looking for students who have some idea of their future career. You may not know exactly what you want to do, but you can see how that university degree in that subject could lead to a future degree, future career. That's, that's again, part of what they're looking for. And of course, this love of learning. And altogether, they'll call that teachability. Um, these academics who are teaching you at university, they are passionate about their subjects. They absolutely live, breathe and eat that subject. They're writing the books that are probably going to be used in your examination. So um, they want to be teaching students who feel the same way, who are going to be a pleasure to teach. So uh, admissions requirements, what exactly are you required to provide when you apply to a UK university? <clears throat> well, the first thing are your academic grades. Um, so you'll, you'll have a transcript or some other method of reporting those grades as required by the university. If English is not your first language, you'll need to have a qualification. And again, every university, every college, <clears throat> excuse me, will have a slightly different um, requirement. Uh, or level, uh, so you, you can do the research and find out what's what's required and work towards that if you need to. You'll need to write for the UK one personal statement, that's the good news, unlike the US where you may be writing an essay for every single institution you apply to, in the UK you just need to write one, but it does need to be really good. You'll need to get one reference, which is gathered together um, within your school from the teachers who know you best. Um, so you don't need to worry about that too much. You just need to keep focusing on your academic achievements. You'll need to do an interview or maybe possibly more than one interview. And we're going to talk about that in more detail now as well. And um, 
for most competitive universities and courses, you will need to do some form of assessment, a subject specific admissions test, in addition to the examinations you're taking, your IGCs, IGCSEs, A levels, IB, whichever examinations you're taking. Some Oxford colleges will also ask you for examples of your essays, for example, that you're doing for A level or other written work, and you will take that along typically to an interview and it will be discussed. It is a rigorous process and the harder the university is to get into, the more rigorous the process has to be because so many students have got excellent academic grades. So how do they distinguish between all these excellent candidates? It's through the combination of all these different aspects of the admissions process. I would say no one um, element is going to be the make or break, uh, is going to decide your future. It's the combination of all of those. Okay, so what is the system in the UK? Well, we have uh, something called UCAS, Universities and Colleges Admission Service. Everybody just calls it UCAS. And it's an online system. It's a fantastic system. Go on the website if it's something you're interested in and browse all the way through the website. There are lots and lots of um, videos and guides and how to um, PDFs that you can open up and, and have a read of. You will make one application for up to five choices of university or course. If it's medical, like medicine or veterinary science or dentistry, you'll have four choices, but otherwise it's five. And everything is tracked online. So you'll start in the apply section and upload all the information. You guys will then forward that on to your five choices and then you'll move on to track. Um, all the way through, you can revisit your application um, you don't have to submit it until you're absolutely ready to. So you'll have lots of opportunity to go in, to change things, redraft, improve, because you'll have your own personal ID and password. It's very easy to follow. And as I say, I thoroughly recommend you, you go on there and have a good look through it. Now, I'm not going to go through all these deadlines, just really to emphasise that for Oxford and Cambridge, the deadlines are earlier than for other UK universities. By the 15th of October, you need to have made your UCAS applications if Oxford or Cambridge are your uh, first choice. If you're doing the pre-interview admissions test, some, of, some are pre-interview, some are at interview, um, you will need to also register for those. BMAT is even earlier. Um, there are two test periods now for, for BMAT. If you're doing the earlier one, it's the 9th of August. If you're doing the other one, it's the 1st of October. So uh, if you want to do medicine, BMAT is the biomedical admissions test. So that's for medicine. Uh, you will need to register for that even earlier. So the, the most important thing I can say is um, do the research, find out when the deadlines are and make sure that you meet the deadlines. There is absolutely no flexibility whatsoever. Uh, if you miss it, then you have to wait for the next admission cycle. And again, there is just one uh, admission cycle. It's not a rolling process. Uh, you have to get everything in by the right deadline. For uh, Cambridge on the 19th of October, you need to have completed something called a COPA, Cambridge Online Preliminary Application. And by the 22nd of October, an SAQ, if you're applying from outside Europe. The SAQ is interesting because although it's just another document you need to complete, it also has the option of a 1200 character Cambridge specific personal statement in there. So you will write your one personal statement, which goes to all the institutions, but you also have the opportunity there to say, what appeals to you about Cambridge? Why have you picked Cambridge? Uh, what is the course that you want to study at Cambridge? And what is it about that course that uh, you believe you're really well suited for? Okay, and for other universities, if you're not applying to Oxford or Cambridge, it's the 15th of January. That's when the UCAS application needs to be in. Those are the dates for 2021 entry. They do vary a little bit each year. So I always say check the relevant universities and the college's websites and make sure you've got the right deadlines. Now then, how do we summarise where we've got to so far? Eight ways to make your application outstanding. Achieve the top grades, number one. Write a strong evidence-based personal statement, and I will explain very shortly what we mean by that. Do practice interview questions and admissions tests, and again, I'm going to be sharing with you some specifics around that. Do lots and lots of research into the institutions and courses you're considering for two reasons. One is you want to be sure that you're picking the right place and the right course for you. And 
um, there is a great deal of choice. So it's really worth spending a lot of time doing that research over a, a period of time. Don't rush it at the end when you're right up against the deadline. You know, start doing that two or three years before your year of entry into university. And it's also important because when you come to make your application, you need to thoroughly understand the course and the place that you're applying to, uh, particularly when you come to write your personal statement and uh, sit an interview. So don't just assume that studying economics at Cambridge is going to be the same as studying it at um, LSE, London School of Economics, because they will be covering different modules. Um, there will be a combination of modules you must take, but also maybe some uh, choice around optional, optional modules as well. Uh, so there will be some differences. There may be differences in the way it's taught as well. You know, some courses are very much based on final examinations. Others have coursework or practical uh, project based learning built into them. Some of them have a year abroad or a year in industry. So there's a lot of difference from one course to another, even though on the surface they may look quite similar. So it is worth doing the research. Read widely. And you're going to hear me saying this quite a lot over the next hour. Um, it is very important. And what we mean by that is, of course, you have to read a lot to pass the examinations that you're taking and to do well. Um, but what these competitive universities are looking for is evidence that students have read more widely. Um, and what we mean by that is not so much the quantity of your reading, but the quality. So identify an area of interest. So for example, if you're looking at medicine, uh, there's so many advances and, and amazing discoveries going on in the medical field right now, such as uh, genetically tailored medicine for cancer treatments, which are really dramatically improving outcomes for uh, par uh, for patients who, you know, would have had very few prospects before. Um, in law, you know, you have very wide a uh, range of different elements within law. You could be interested in family law, corporate law, international law, contract law. Um, for each subject, engineering, again, so many different branches of engineering, chemical engineering, aeronautical, automotive, production engineering. Um, so delve a little bit deeper into the subject you're interested in applying for and start reading more widely. Um, download some articles, go on websites, and I'll, I'll share with you some specific uh, suggestions of ways you can do that shortly. If you have an opportunity, do some work experience. Sometimes if you do it through school um, early on, you haven't yet decided what you're going to study at university, so it's difficult to choose work experience that is relevant. So you may have to do something a little bit closer to your application that is relevant to the course you're applying for. Um, if you have a chance to do an internship, that's great or shadowing um, or if if you um, can't get actual work experience sometimes that can be quite difficult to do for example in, in a medical environment hospitals are uh, reluctant sometimes to take students in then you can do some volunteering you know so many organizations are really desperate for help and if you can offer your time on a regular basis my son um, every Sunday morning he would do some volunteering um, and that really helps your, your application as well. It could be in a local care home or a hospice, somewhere like that, for example, for medicine. Um, have a think about that. Do enter some awards. Uh, you don't have to win, um, but it, it shows your commitment if you enter an award. And there are lots and lots of fantastic essay awards. Cambridge University alone, pretty much every college runs its own essay awards. So go on there and check it out. Peter House, for example, um, I know there's an essay competition that's still open there, uh, but there are essays in history, English, science, so many different areas uh, that you could enter, depending on what your, your field of interest is. And that really shows your commitment. Um, do attend some courses. There could be courses like ours in Cambridge, but uh, there could be something local that you could join maybe um, while you're studying or in the holidays. Clubs and societies in school or outside school. Try and take a leadership position if you possibly can, because again, this this adds weight to your personal statement. Or you could do something like a, an international project qualification or a, do a research project through your school or independently. Again, this is all about showing your commitment and going a little bit beyond what uh, is required for the examination. And do develop these critical thinking and communication skills that I've been talking about. Now. 
um, you should start doing this a few years before you apply. As you get closer to the application deadlines, you'll be focusing very much on things like writing a personal statement and you'll have examination pressures as well. So all these extra enrichment activities are things that you could be starting to do um, earlier on in, in your school. Read some articles, um, make a note of any projects or research or lectures that you attend or podcasts that you, you watch. Um, positions of responsibility and clubs that you belong to, any volunteering or work experience, and also your extracurricular activities, sports, music, debating. All of this um, can feed into your personal statement. And it's it's difficult to keep track. And sometimes you forget what you've what you've read or what you've done as the date approaches to write your personal statement. So it's it's good to have something which is readily accessible. Um, so while you're reading, for example, take some notes and uh, you can use this kind of format. This is something we've developed for our students on our Cambridge course or produce your own a anything that works for you. And you can keep a record. OK, we're going to move on to personal statement writing. And uh, this is applicable for all UK applications. So you'll write one personal statement for all the universities you're applying to. So do not name any particular institution. It needs to be generic. You can't name a specific university in your personal statement. There is a particular format that you need to follow. It's 4,000 characters, including spaces, line spaces, paragraph spaces, and it's 47 lines, whichever comes sooner. And you need to focus on your academic achievements in there. So provide examples of all those things that I just mentioned, the reading, the enrichment, work experience and so on. And the important thing is not to just list them, but to think about how those have helped you to develop relevant skills or relevant knowledge for the course that you're applying to. So, for example, if you do a Duke of Edinburgh award, uh, you could be saying that the uh, expedition helped you to develop leadership skills or resilience in the face of, of challenges. If you do some work experience, that might be helping you develop time management and the ability to prioritise tasks um, and organise your work. So think about what it is that you're doing um, and how that's helping you prepare for university and re really sort of um, reflect on that so that it's not just a list which is boring to read um, but it does show the reader the the admissions tutor um, specifically how you are suited for the course you've applied for you start with a very good strong opening statement or paragraph and you finish with a strong conclusion and it's really all about demonstrating your commitment to the course that you're applying for Try and apply for similar types of courses because, again, it's difficult having only one personal statement if you spread yourself too thinly and you're applying for many different types of courses. So my recommendation is try and keep your course choices fairly similar. And remember, it's a potential springboard for discussion at interview. So um, you will not be in a position to decide what's asked in the interview, of course, but if it's in your personal statement, there, there's always the possibility um, that the interviewer will, will ask you about that, um, and that plays to your advantage. <coughs> okay, some top tips for personal statement writing. Number one, make the first sentence or paragraph stand out. Really work on that. That's probably the hardest thing that you will do. Uh, so when you come to write your personal statement, uh, some people have far too much, you know, so they do a bit of a, drum, a, a brain dump on the page and they think, how on earth am I going to uh, cut this down to 4,000 characters? Other people just don't know where to start. They have a blank page, blank mind, and they don't know where to start. So um, think these things through. Um, ask yourself, what, what did inspire my love of the subject? Why did I choose this subject? Was there something I read or saw a program on the TV? Did I speak to somebody who perhaps was practicing in that field? Is there someone in my family who works in that area? What was it that inspired my love of the subject? Um, and slowly but surely you will, you will build up enough information to write your personal statement. But do work on that first sentence um, and try and make it as original as you possibly can because that's what's going to grab the reader's attention right at the start. 
avoid unnecessary detail. So do not ramble, you know, make it really concise, succinct. Um, and this is something that comes with practice. The more you work on it, the tighter it becomes. Uh, make sure it has a good structure and it flows. So just one idea per sentence and one big idea per paragraph. Don't try and uh, jump around too much within a paragraph. Try and, and keep it logical and well structured so it's easy to read. Include lots of relevant evidence. Um, so when you say uh, you really enjoy an aspect of the subject, think about the evidence you can include which shows that maybe an article you read um, or a podcast you watched or a course you went on put that in there and as I say with any luck you might get asked about that and that's something you can talk about um, with real passion avoid lists and particularly bullet points that's not acceptable at all it's formal English well-structured piece of work like you would for an essay for an examination and avoid cliches don't say i've always wanted to be a doctor because clearly you haven't you, you weren't born wanting to be a doctor and you'd be surprised how many people put that in their personal statement and i know it's something that makes admissions tutors really grimace they don't like reading that so avoid cliches make it original make it personal to you that's what it is as a personal statement it's about you but don't start each sentence with I. Try and think of a different way of, of structuring that sentence because again, that becomes repetitive and uh, boring to read. Do reflect on the skills you've learned and why they're relevant. Be honest and don't copy. Don't copy off the internet and don't copy from anyone else. Um, UCAS uses really sophisticated copy catch software to assess similarity, not just between your personal statement and all the others it has received over the years, but it's also capturing personal statements off the internet all the time. So you, your personal statement will be compared to everything else that's out there. And if there is an unacceptable level of similarity, you will be in trouble. So do not copy, make it your own work. By all means, read other people's work, you'll get ideas, but do not copy the actual phrases from anyone else's work. Do be positive, enthusiastic all the way through. Sometimes it's tempting, you know, to just uh, slip in something that doesn't sound quite as positive, um, particularly if you're talking about um, obstacles you've overcome or uh, challenges you've addressed, but do keep it really positive, show your passion. Do consider your spelling. I've introduced a few obvious errors here to make my point. Your spelling, apostrophes i mean native english speakers get this wrong all the time uh it's the bane of my life as a linguist um very important to put your apostrophes in the right place and this is an academic piece of work so it must be correct similarly the grammar and don't rely on the spell check on your computer it's not foolproof what i would suggest is a couple of things because if you're writing and writing and redrafting which is important that you do the brain eventually starts to see what it thinks is there that's just the way we're made so take a break you know maybe sleep on it for a few days go back and it's amazing how the typos and the errors will just jump out and hit you and you think why didn't i see that last time um but also get other people to read it um perhaps someone come to it with a fresh eye who hasn't read it before um and who can give you some positive feedback a teacher an advisor a member of your family uh, so that's really important and do keep working on it you know uk students typically will be doing 10, 15, maybe even up to 20 drafts of their personal statement before they're happy with it. But eventually you will be, you know, one day you'll wake up and think, yes, this is in the right shape, format. It's saying what I want to say. It's, it's got the right sort of strength and passion behind it. Um, I'm pleased with it, I'm happy with it. And then, then you can go ahead and submit it. Now, remember what I was saying about rider reading? And I would say listening, it's not just about reading, it's 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 okay to listen as well. So um, you can compile a reading list for the subject you're applying for. Do search the faculty and college and, and university websites for suggested books. My HE Plus um, has been developed by Cambridge University and it's a fantastic source. You can go on there and you, by any subject you can search for resources and you can go into the branches and sub branches of that subject and it will give you lots and lots of ideas of articles and podcasts and things you can be doing um, and that's just one uh, one website every college of cambridge university practically has um, resources or reading lists for example that you can um, have a look at do you keep abreast of current affairs and news in the subject area that you're interested in studying at university 
So, for example, the BBC News website is very good for um, news on health. It has these different categories that you can look at on a regular basis, health, business, tech, science and so on. BMJ, that's the British, um, British Medical Journal. There is a student version, uh, which I strongly recommend, particularly as you're approaching um, you know, your, your last year at school and when you're making your application. Uh, just to keep abreast of medical developments, if that's the subject you're applying for. Similarly, The Economist is a great magazine um, to start reading if that's an area you're interested in, or The New Scientist if, if it's STEM-related subjects that you're interested in, uh, and there are many others. You don't have to buy these. Um, very often, you, they're available through libraries, uh, through your school, or even through universities, uh, and very often they're available online as well. Do watch relevant podcasts, and I, I stress the word relevant because it's very easy to get distracted. You don't want to spread yourself too thinly, and you don't have enough time to do that. So really focus on the podcasts, the videos that are of most relevance to the subject you're thinking of applying for. TED Talks are great, um, great choice of talks on there. Oxford University, um, which is the next website there, they publish podcasts. SMS.com, that's the Cambridge version. UniTalks, which is uh, also listed there, IAI TV. Um, and the Times Higher Education, they have lots of podcasts on there. And they're really useful sources of information, as I say. If you know which subject you're interested in, you can go in there and just make it a habit, um, a positive habit, every now and again when you've got some time, perhaps at the end of your school week, to go in and have a look. And update your, your knowledge um, and start forming your own opinions as well. Do you write down um, what you think of what you're reading and watching? Do you agree or do you disagree and why? Because this, this is uh, the sort of thing that you will be encouraged to discuss in your interview um, and it's sometimes it's difficult to remember. So if you write it down at the time then you can go back and uh, refer to that again or read it or watch it again. I would recommend that you do that before your interview anyway and just find out what it is that interests you. Uh, the more you can find a specialist area that interests you, um, the easier you're going to find it going into your interview to have something interesting to say. So going on to interviews, and let's have a look at, at interviews for competitive UK universities, a very important part of the whole admissions process. Typically, they will be 20 to 45 minutes each. Each university and college will do it slightly differently, but you'll know before you go for your interview what the format is going to be. For the academic universities, the competitive universities, it's very much subject specific. Um, so it's formal. It's much more formal, for example, than a US interview is, is usually. Um, they're interested primarily in your academic abilities and your suitability for the course. And it's based on what are known as supervisions or tutorials in these top universities in the UK, like Oxford and Cambridge. So the, the typical style of learning in Cambridge or Oxford is either to go along to a lecture in your faculty, law, medicine, economics, um, philosophy, psychology, whatever it is, with hundreds of other students and listen to the lecturer speaking from the front, or to be in a very small group, maybe three, four students in a room, usually in your professor's room, in your college, where you have been set some work to do. You'll have a couple, two or three each week, and you'll have been set an essay or a problem to solve, some piece of work which you'll bring along with you, prepared to discuss. So you'll be sharing ideas with your fellow students, also with uh, your, um, your teacher, your, your professor, and you have to be prepared to think on the spot, to think aloud. So that's what they're kind of testing you for in the interview. It's, it's based on that style of learning, just to see if you're comfortable. You might not be 100% um, sure what you're doing. That's absolutely fine. You're not expected to be um, on sort of top form because it's, it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit challenging. Um, but are you able to work your way through the questions that you're asked in that sort of situation? They're testing your academic qualities primarily, how you think and whether you can think aloud and share that thought process, how committed you are to the subject and the evidence that you can bring to bear, the knowledge that you've gained perhaps by your wider reading and your suitability for the course. So it's just one tool in the process. It's not kind of the final hurdle. Don't feel if you had a bad interview, that's it. It's all over. It's just one tool in, in the whole process. Um, 
but it is important to perform well and it's something you can prepare for um, with all of the admissions process the, the good news is you can prepare you can practice and you can improve and you i've seen this happen many many times with students where the first practice interview we do is terrible they're really stuck they're like rabbits in the headlights they cannot think of one single thing to say and they get more and more flustered and embarrassed and the second time they're a little bit happier they've realized what's being expected of them that they don't have to have the answer straight off in fact there may not be a right or wrong answer the most important thing is to engage and come up with something um and slowly but surely they begin to start performing better so you know if it's not your natural environment don't worry you can improve definitely um it's all about applying your existing knowledge to unfamiliar problems so you'll be asked questions you haven't probably encountered before. They will be based on the learning you've done in school. So maybe based on A-level science, for example, if, if it's a science subject you're applying for, but it will be going beyond that. It may even be at first year university level. So it's going to be more difficult than you've encountered before, um, but you can draw on your existing knowledge to begin to answer it. You will very often have more than one interviewer and for Oxford or Cambridge, typically you will have two or three interviews. Uh, one of the differences between Cambridge and Oxford is in Cambridge, you will have all your interviews on one day. So you'll arrive in the morning, you'll have your interviews, you'll go home at night, um, almost without exception. Whereas with Oxford, if you have more than one interview, very often they'll go over into the next day. There could be interviews at different colleges. So you probably find yourself staying overnight in Oxford. And the reason that is, um, one slight difference between Oxford and Cambridge is when you apply to an Oxford college, you go for an interview with that college, you may be successful, uh, you may get an offer eventually when, when the whole process is uh, uh, sort of reviewed and assessed. Um, it may be a conditional offer, it may be, uh, you may not get an offer, but there's an in-between, which is you will be pooled, P-O-O-L-E-D. We have something called the pool, like a swimming pool. And what that means is the college that you've applied for doesn't have a place for you. Maybe it's been inundated with an amazing number of applications for that particular subject in that year, um, but they know you are of the right standard. They just haven't got a place for you. Um, so, the important thing is um, then to understand that other other colleges will have been given your application materials, your personal statement, the interview notes, admission test results, and they will be considering you as well. And if one of those colleges is interested in uh, making you an offer, um, they may invite you to interview or they may just make you the offer. Whereas with Oxford, the pooling system happens much earlier on. So all the uh, colleges will share your application and uh, you may find yourself being interviewed by more than one college who is interested in you, which is great because you've got more than one chance of getting an offer. Okay, uh, you may be given prompt material during the interview, uh, for example, to read a text. Uh, so for a humanities subject like English or languages, typically you'll be given a poem or something short, short piece of text to read and discuss. Um, if it's science, you know, physics, engineering, that sort of thing. It could be a graph, a diagram, um, some mathematical problem to solve. Um, if it's psychology, it could be some sort of experiment um, and a question related to that. So depends very much on the subject, but typically you'll be given some prompt material during the interview, which you'll be having to discuss. Bear in mind, there aren't really any trick questions. Um, there's a lot of myth around Oxbridge interviews. Um, but equally, there's a lot of information online, lots and lots of videos and guidance on the university websites, the college websites, also on UCAS. So do go on there. You'll, you'll see practice interviews and example interviews. So you'll get a really good feel for what it is you're going to be asked and how it's going to be done. Uh, but it will be challenging. And uh, it's all about, as I say, distinguishing between excellent candidates. Cambridge does interview a higher percentage of candidates than Oxford. So Cambridge's philosophy is if you have a realistic chance of success, you'll be offered an interview. That means you've got the grades, you've written a great personal statement, you've passed the admissions test um, and um, you've qualified for the interview. Um, whereas Oxford will tend to use the admissions test to narrow down the field for interviews. <coughs> now then, some top tips for performing well in interviews. Think of it as a two-way discussion. 
work through your problems, um, whatever you've been given, the problems, the issues, in dialogue. Uh, as I say, it's, it's like this supervision or tutorial type setting that you'll encounter when you become a student. And so it's not question, answer, question, answer. It's very much about engaging in a discussion, a conversation. Do show your passion for the subject. Um, research the course before, long before the interview um, and have a really thorough understanding of what's going to be covered in the course, which modules you might enjoy best, the ones you might choose where you have um, some choice in the matter. And the interviewer will be very interested to, to find out your thoughts on that um, and the fact you've done that research and you've got a really good understanding of the course you're applying for. Practice the answers to the obvious questions like why do you want to apply here? Why have you picked this subject? Uh, do be able to talk about your personal statement, so read it well before the interview and do have another look at the articles or the books that you've referred to in there. There's nothing worse than turning up for an interview and you've forgotten the book or the article that you've put in there and you're asked about it in the interview and you just cannot remember it. Um, and I do know students that has happened to. You'll be kicking yourself. So do read it, um, have it fresh in your mind and hopefully you'll be asked about it because that's something you will have explored it'll be fresh in your mind you'll have views on it you can discuss it knowledgeably articulately um so that will work to your advantage expect the unexpected you never know what they're going to throw at you um when my son went for his medicine interview he was interviewed by the head of the school of medicine the clinical school at cambridge who's a total expert in her field uh, who writes the books but he was also interviewed by uh, someone in the college who was the head of history of art who was also an admissions tutor who showed him some pictures relating to the human body um, and asked him to discuss them um, so you never really know what um, what you're going to be asked uh, but stay calm you know again they're looking for students who've got this academic curiosity who are not phased who are going to say oh that's really interesting i'm not sure what it's telling me but i you know um this is this is what i take from it so stay positive listen hard believe it or not the interview will, interviewer is often trying to help you because they are looking for good candidates they desperately want to recruit the best um students for their course so do listen hard uh, they'll be saying things like um yeah, you're on the right lines or keep going, go on. Or would you like to rethink that? Maybe think that through again. Do you think you're um, looking at that in the right way? Or is there any further information that would be helpful for you to have to answer that question? Um, so listen hard and take your cue from that and maybe ask a question in return and keep trying and uh, learn from your mistakes. I mean, it's not unusual for a student to come up with an answer immediately under pressure and then as they think it through and as they're given more information and they discuss it further with the interviewer, they think, actually, my first answer, I am not happy with that now. And that's absolutely fine. You can say, could I go back to my answer? Could could I rephrase that? Could I reformulate that? Because I feel now I've got a better understanding. I didn't fully understand that at the start and I wasn't applying the right uh, criteria or the right factors. What that shows the interviewer is that you're learning from the process um, and you're going to be an ideal candidate. You're going to be an ideal student because that's very much what happens during your supervision as well. So don't be disconcerted. Don't be... Um, disheartened if you feel oh I got that wrong you know I wasn't thinking that through properly do have the courage to go back and um, rephrase it or, or explain that you've got a different view on that now because they're very interested in because your reasons why that's that's what they'll be probing you for not just what you think but, but why you think it um, so be prepared to ask some questions and develop your answers as you go through the interview don't over rehearse the temp temptation is to learn all the answers off by heart um but it doesn't come across well so by all means um practice your answers just don't over rehearse or learn your answers word for word and try and be yourself just just be natural uh, and try and enjoy it the candidates who have been most successful in my experience are those who actually come out and say it was tough really tough and i didn't answer all the questions but actually i quite enjoyed it um i know that might be hard to believe at this point um but i think you'll find as you get closer to it and you feel more prepared and it is the subject that you really want to study at university that it is something you could possibly enjoy 
Now then, we're moving on to admissions tests and written work for um, UK applications. Most competitive universities and courses do require a test, not just Oxford and Cambridge, uh, but most of the uh, leading UK universities. Unlike um, the US where it's an SAT, ACT sort of standardised test, this is very subject specific. So you can go on the university website, you can search by subject and every subject will have its own test and the format will be quite different from one test to another. They do have different deadlines. Remember I said BMAT for medicine is the first one that you've got to uh, register for. And you can only sit it once, that's very important, unlike um, the, the tests of the US where you might have multiple uh, test results or chances, um, you can only sit this once, so give it your all, make sure you're thoroughly prepared for it. It's either pre-interview, so you, you go to a, a, an exam, a test centre, um, hopefully not too far from, from where you live, um, usually a school in the country, and you can do it there or sometimes you'll be asked to do it at interview but again all of this will be known in advance you can go on to the university website the faculty website and check psychology is it pre-interview at interview by subject it's testing your thinking skills and your subject knowledge or aptitude so there'll be usually a reasoning component to it whether it's verbal or multiple choice or um, essay based but it will also test your subject knowledge or your aptitude. If it's a subject you're not studying at school, for example, like law, you won't be expected to have covered the content. Of course you haven't, uh, because it's not a subject that you can study at school. So they'll be, study they'll be looking for aptitude. So have you got the right skills? Are you able to analyse information and dissect an argument and come up with a well-reasoned conclusion based on the evidence? Um, so that, that's what they're going to be testing you for, rather than any specific knowledge about the law, for example. Do check the test requirements and you will find lots and lots of practice papers on the university websites like admissionstesting.org or ucas.com. So you can go on there, you can download the practice papers uh, for free. You can, Very often they will have the um, model answers as well. Those are the best type because then you can do it under timed conditions. Um, on your own and then you can look at the, the model answers and see how you compare. So some top tips for admissions tests. Register before the deadline. Do know the test structure and the mark scheme. Make sure you're, you're familiar with that. Think about the timing for each section. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, everyone is better at some things than others. We're not all uh, equally good at everything, of course. So some of the areas of the test you may find you can speed up in because you're familiar with it, it's, it comes more easily to you and that leaves you a little bit more time for the areas, uh, for example, writing an essay where you, you might find it a little bit more difficult. So do plan your approach and that's where the practice comes in useful because the more you practice under timed conditions, uh, the more familiar you will be with what, um, what lies ahead um, and you can plan your approach to, to that test. Work on your critical thinking and essay writing skills because they're very likely to be part of, of the test for most tests. Um, but also, you know, sleep well the night before, um, do, do get plenty of rest and eat well and try and keep a good balance in your life, you know, between work and play because um, it's at a very pressured time in, in school. Um, everything seems to be happening at once. Um, so try and relax, try and sleep well, but also check out the venue and arrive early. This is true for interviews as well. If you have separate interviews and admissions tests on different days, do check out the location of where you've got to get to. Do get there in plenty of time. So if you know you have to drive through traffic and it might be congested, um, or if it's a location you've never been to before, or you're taking public transport, just leave plenty of time. A strong overall application, how do we summarise all of this? So as well as achieving top grades, do begin early. Um, do your in-depth research, read beyond the curriculum, uh, or watch uh, podcasts and lectures, uh, redraft your personal statement many times, practice your interview questions, and seek out relevant enrichment opportunities. Focus on supracurricular. What that means is supra means going beyond the curriculum, um, more than extracurricular. Extracurricular will be your sports, your music, your drama, that kind of thing. 
which are important for work-life balance and certainly as a student as well you will expect to have some hobbies some interests some extracurricular activities but for the more academic universities they are focusing primarily on supracurricular that means what are you doing to go beyond the studies at school to further your knowledge um, to go more in depth in into the subject you want to study at university and reflect on everything you do just reflect on how it's going to help you succeed I'm not going to read all of these out but if you want to take a screenshot or take a picture these are some useful websites uh, the first one is about student visas um, British Council is, is useful as well um, but there are lots and lots of different websites here where you can research universities make more informed choices of subjects that will lead to your university degree um, and the last two student room uh, actually the, the two up from the bottom studential and student room um, they are student websites so you can get the students point of view as well and for Oxbridge some specific sources which are useful for Oxbridge applications again the last two Oxbridge admissions applied to Cambridge are written by students for students so you'll get a different perspective there the three up from that Downing, King's and Christ there are three colleges at um, Cambridge University and they all have excellent uh, information on there of resources and articles you can read books as I say it's not about the, the quantity it's very much about the quality so don't feel overwhelmed just pick a, a small number of uh, books or articles that you feel will be helpful okay now I'm going to move on to Cambridge Dream I hope all of that was uh, useful information for you for Oxbridge applications um, but I want to introduce the, the summer program now as well and share with you the, the scholarship information for those of you who might be interested to apply so they're exciting summer enrichment programs based on a Cambridge University College. Our students are from 13 up to 18. And we teach in two different age groups, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, we have British and international students mixed together in teams working together. Uh, you'll be taught by expert Cambridge lecturers, brilliant people, um, and mentored, assisted, guided by um, Cambridge students in the subject you're interested in studying so uh, we'll team you up with a medical student or a law student or economic student whichever subject uh, you, you choose during your registration for the course and um, they are amazing they're talented brilliant but also lovely students lovely people very approachable they love working for Cambridge Dream if you go on our website you'll see feedback from the people who work with us each year as well as the students who attend and their parents and the teachers everybody gives us amazing feedback and people come back to work for us every year until they leave the university um, and some of them go on and do PhDs and carry on working for us as lecturers so so, uh, it's fantastic uh, it's a they love helping students British and international students and they're such a valuable resource it's project-based learning uh, working in very small classes lots of one-to-one -one advice and support in all aspects of university applications so we'll be sitting down working on personal statements as a scheduled part of the course uh, for example you'll be learning inside and outside the classroom this is a lovely picture of King's College with the students' bicycles. Uh, so we have two programmes for this summer. One is the Advanced Academic Studies and University Preparation for 15 to 18 year olds. And um, we combine tuition in your specialist subject. I'll share with you in a moment which subjects areas you can choose from. Uh, you'll also be doing some projects based on real world problems. So for example, in engineering, you'll be set a problem that you'll work on in a team throughout the two weeks. Um, addressing a real world problem that real engineers um, face for example you'll also attend lectures we have separate workshops developing your thinking and communication skills uh, as I say we will have scheduled times to work on your personal statement you'll have to submit one before you a short one before you attend the course and then you'll carry working carry on working on that we'll do practice interviews practice admissions tests so that will all help with your application and give you lots of one-to-one -one feedback and professional careers advice so if you're not in if you're not really sure which subject you want to apply for and lots and lots of students don't know and um, that's that's quite normal until closer to the time then we can help you to narrow down your choices and do the research you'll do a final project presentation in your team 
and you'll have lots of admissions talks and university visits as well. So that sums up the, the uh, programme for the older students. For the younger students, 13 to 14 year olds, um, it's leadership skills and STEAM, STEAM being science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. Uh, so it's cross-curricular, uh, lots and lots of hands-on team challenges in robotics, coding. We have something called Raspberry Pi you might have come across, invented in Cambridge, a little tiny microcomputer. So you learn how to code that and then use that to operate a robot. 3D design and printing, virtual reality. So lots of new technologies that we'll be introducing you to and uh, you'll have projects working with those. We do have subject discussion classes like the supervision. So you'll also do some of those like the older students and attend some lectures. You'll have a university application seminar. You won't be working on a personal statement because you don't need that yet or um, doing admissions tests, but you'll get a good understanding of what lies ahead and what you can be doing to prepare for that. And of course, you'll be doing lots of skills development in these um, vital areas in teamwork, communication, critical thinking, problem solving, and so on. These are the subject choices, business and economics, or medicine, or philosophy and psychology, or law, or STEM. So you'll choose that as part of your registration, and you'll be with other students who've chosen those subjects as well. You'll be taught by lecturers in those subjects. So this is a list of the what we would call the super curricular enrichment opportunities you'll gain on the course. You'll be studying subjects, topics of interest beyond the curriculum working in small classes with academics and professionals. By professionals, we mean people working in that sphere, in that field. So we'll be introducing you to people um, who are working in uh, hospitals or working for solicitors or in courts um, or working in business. So it's not just academics. You'll get a feel for careers, what it might be like to work in that area as well. You'll be mentored by this, these brilliant Cambridge University students I mentioned. You'll be collaborating on lots of projects, exploring your university choices, one-to-one um, -one feedback and admissions advice and practicing your application, developing the skills, the confidence, the passion, the motivation you need to succeed. Also, when you're not working, you'll be enjoying some fantastic Oxbridge social and cultural activities. I'm going to show you some photographs to finish um, to give you an idea of, of uh, to sort of bring that to life as to what you'll be doing day to day and you'll have a safe immersive experience of life at a leading university so here here i'll just flick through some photographs quickly so you can uh get a feel for that uh so this is uh one of the uh, small classes we talked about this is a stem workshop um these students have built this little robot from a, a chassis wheel sensors and they're using the raspberry pi to maneuver it forwards backwards in a circle and so on uh, we do have some classes outdoors. This is an outdoor supervision uh, by one of our student mentors. Um, you'd be writing a personal statement, attending a lecture. This one's in the Astronomy Institute of the University, but we have many different types of lectures that you can choose from. Uh, we have students visiting the plant research department. So that's something that these students have shown an interest in. Um, doing a practice interview, um, developing communication skills through a model United Nations workshop. So here we have a Russian girl, a um, young man from um, Italy who was living in the UK actually, and then on the right a young man from China, but together they're representing France. If you're familiar with the model United Nations format, uh, that's what we follow. Uh, if you're not, it doesn't matter, we will explain that all to you. Uh, so you're not going to be sitting just sort of listening to teachers, as I say, you'll be on your feet, You'll be practicing your thinking aloud, your thinking skills, um, communicating, public speaking. Um, if that's not something you're comfortable with, don't worry. As I say, we do recognize that people's talents vary. Uh, we all have different strengths, but I can assure you, as the days go on, by the time you come into your second week, you will be on your feet, raring to go. You will have points of view, you will have things you want to say, um, and you, you will be itching to, to get involved because that's the way it works. It's a very exciting um, sort of program, um, but we won't put you under pressure to do something that you're not comfortable to do. We'll wait until you feel comfortable and you feel you've got the, the skills to do that. Making a business pitch, uh, these two students have developed a sort of eating smart program so that's that's what they're standing up to present as you can say having a quite a, uh, an enjoyable time doing that engaging with the audience um this is 3d design uh for the younger students 
all the time you'll be gaining cultural awareness. I know that you're with students from many different nationalities already, but I assure you, you will meet more students from different parts of the world that you probably never have come across before. And um, for example, on the right there, we have a girl from uh, Finland, uh, someone else from the US, from India, from the UK, uh, from China, from Hong Kong. So quite a, quite a mixture. Um, everybody does a sports leaders award and uh, this is our sports leader instructor here on the right, Keith, who uh, is leading that. And um, seven tutored hours during which you will come up with your own leadership activity based on maybe a sport you enjoy or a hobby or an interest. It's, you don't have to play a game of football if that's not something you're interested in, but you could come up with, I don't know, something relating to dance or martial arts or something that you enjoy. You'll develop a lesson plan and then you'll teach that to your fellow students and at the end of that um, time you will have uh, achieved an award which is externally accredited and which is useful for your personal statement. All the college bedrooms are en suite so they all have private bathrooms, they're very nice and spacious, new. Um, you'll attend a formal college dinner by candlelight which is, which is uh, really exciting. Uh, you'll visit places like King's College, the very famous iconic King's College Chapel there on the right from King Henry the seventh and King Henry the eighth's time. It took a long time to build. You'll be punting on the river. You'll be visiting lots of museums. If that's something you're interested in, Cambridge has eight of its own university museums in every field you could possibly be interested in, from polar exploration to natural history to arts and antiquities. The Fitzwilliam Museum rivals the British Museum in London. It's an amazing place. You can spend a whole day there if, if uh, in the middle of Sunday, if that's what floats your boat. You'll all be um, attending a Shakespeare play as part of the Cambridge Shakespeare Festival outdoors in the evening in a private college garden, which is very um, atmospheric as the, the light goes down and uh, these professional performers are really bringing the play to life. So even if Shakespeare is um, unfathomable to you, I assure you, you will thoroughly understand this once you actually see it being performed. Visit to Oxford, visit to the colleges, you'll have admissions talk there, but you'll also have some time to, to familiarise yourself with uh, Oxford University as well as Cambridge. Uh, you'll be visiting Stratford-on-Avon, Shakespeare's birthplace. You have the chance to go somewhere like Grantchester Orchard, which is a very famous Cambridge destination, which you walk along the riverbank to for afternoon tea. Uh, you'll spend a day in London, um, again, visiting London universities for the older students, um, but also some time to, to look around and visit some of the attractions in London. The outcomes are the competencies you need to progress to university, advanced specialist subject knowledge, critical thinking, problem solving, improved written and verbal communication, uh, familiarity with uh, the university style of learning, leadership, teamwork, motivation, focus, self-belief, resilience. All of these competencies are going to be really useful for you as you move forward into university. And we have some tangible takeaways as well, a certificate of attendance signed by myself, a leadership award, an end of course report. So all the feedback you're getting from your tutors will be gathered together. We evaluate you constantly, um, but in a very constructive, positive way. So if you make a good speech, if you do some good research, ask a good question, all of that will go forwards into your end of course report, which will be shared with you. And then you can take that home to your parents. Um, the older students, as I said, will be writing a personal statement and also developing a personal plan, uh, setting out their goals for the future and how you're going to achieve those. A reading list, if you don't have one already, you'll start working that enrichment record that I showed you. And of course, you'll have all that enhanced subject knowledge and the skills and the motivation to succeed. And you'll have made lots of new friends and uh, connections for life. Um, it's a great skill networking and making connections and it's very useful as you move through university. So you can start doing that if you haven't already. You can uh, connect with um, the people who are teaching you, the mentors, the students, stay in touch with them and they can be really useful uh, sources for you in the future. Here are the dates and the fees, 26th of July to the 8th of August 2020. The full fee cost is £3,950 sterling for two weeks. That is all inclusive. 
from the minute you arrive at the airport to the minute you leave. Uh, so all your tuition, your accommodation, your food, your transport, your um, travel uh, entrances, everything like that's included. Uh, the airport transfers, you'll be met at the airport, brought to Cambridge and back at the end. <coughs> and if there are um, 10 students from the UAE, we do also uh, cover the cost of a group leader to come uh, with you. Um, but you can travel independently as well. It's, it's entirely up to you. We are offering scholarships for 25% of the fees for GEM students, so 2963 after the scholarship, so a significant discount. There are 20 scholarships to be awarded. The application deadline was the 31st of March, but with your schools now being closed, I'm going to extend that now to the end of April just to give you a bit more time. Um, you don't have to wait until then because they will be awarded on a rolling basis. Um, but as I say, we, we will uh, continue offering scholarships until that deadline, the 30th of April. If you've got any questions, you can email me. That is the application procedure. So full instructions can be found uh, there um, and you can email me for those or you can ask your um, teachers or your counsellors, your advisors uh, for the GEMS um, link as well. You have to complete an application form uh, and on that form do show that you attend a GEMS school in the right box um, where it asks you and you need to write a 250 word mini personal statement and email it with a recent transcript or report, something to prove that you're getting 70% or above average grades to us at Cambridge Stream. Very quickly in summary, this is what makes us different. Small classes with academics and professionals, it's very enjoyable. The feedback we get from our students is that they have a great time and they learn a lot. Um, you have passionate, committed tutors. <coughs> Excuse me, it's um, a very immersive experience, lots of one-to-one -one support and professional advice and we really do care about our students and we make learning fun. I won't show you this because uh, we're running short of time and I want to make sure we have some time for questions and answers but there is lots of feedback from our students and everybody else involved in the course which you can see on our website. Just briefly on the coronavirus to finish off, um, <clears throat> there is an update on our website so you can go on there kimestream.com just type in coronavirus or coronavirus update, you'll find that the key points are the programmes are scheduled to go ahead as planned. Um, if events move beyond our control and we are forced to cancel or postpone the programme, for example, due to new government re uh, restrictions, then we'll make every effort to offer you alternative dates or an alternative venue. But if that's not acceptable, we will pay a full refund. And that's covered in our terms and conditions. So you can book with confidence. Uh, if it's something you want to do. Um, but as always, we always say this um, every year, do make sure you have suitable travel and medical insurance, because if you do become ill or you're able to travel for any reason, you want to be covered for that. And I'll finish with this, uh, live your dream. I would say um, if it's something you're interested to do, do the preparation, do the research and uh, by all means, go for it. And uh, I wish you every success, uh, whatever decision you make, wherever you apply. And thank you very much for listening. So I'm now going to go back into the control panel and see if we've got some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. This was so incredibly helpful. And I was typing our questions and, and comments from our, our very shy young lady group with me. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, this, this was so thorough, so well researched and so well presented and it's been recorded. So we will figure out where to put this up on our my path to uni resources, but we would like to host another one when more students are back from spring break and as well as more of our counsellors. Thank you so much. We're so grateful. You're very welcome. I'm sorry my voice was giving out a little bit there. <laughs> Hopefully you could hear. So um, do you want me to answer these questions or do you want to, to do that an, another day, another way? Has it's everybody... your choice. Does anyone else have any other questions? I think because uh, we have Sandeep, Sophia, Hatem, Shelley. I think they everything was was addressed so thoroughly and they want to kind of dig into um, the web resources 
And what really was helpful from my little quiet peanut gallery group over here um, are the re the UCAS uh, resources. Um, so I think they're as grade 10 and 11 students, year 12 and 11. They're a little bit overwhelmed right now for the UCAS process and uh, want to have a think and then uh, get into uh, the Oxford Cambridge application process. So, yeah, sure. I mean, the great news is that it's exactly the same application process for Oxford and Cambridge as every other UK university. And whether you're applying from London or Dubai, you will be treated the same way. You will go through exactly the same process. Uh, it's a very fair and equitable uh, system. And I, I think UCAS is a brilliant website, actually. Um, you can do it just bite-sized pieces when you've got time. Have a have a look at the videos. Have a, have a look at the guidance. It goes through it step by step by step. It's it's really useful. And I have to say, Cambridge University website uh, and Oxford um, are very very helpful as well. Lots of detailed information. But I do understand it is a bit overwhelming. Um, and maybe you know, for those students who've got some time this summer. That's a really good use of time to do that research and, and go through everything and start to firm up their ideas and narrow down their choices. Making choices is difficult, isn't it? Because there are so many things you can do, so many opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but in, in amongst the, the, the um, information there, Informed Choices by the Russell Group, uh, that was one of the websites. It's a new one that they brought out last year, Informed Choices. And there's actually a sort of a flow chart. So you start by answering the question, I know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do. And it'll take you all the way through uh, and take you through. And it will start showing you the kind of combinations of subjects you could take at A-level and the kind of degrees it could lead to. And Cambridge has got something similar, which is really useful. Um, it's um, Again, it's in that, uh, in that webinar, but you'll find it on the Cambridge University website, Subject Matters, I think it's called. And it was it will explain, for example, you know, if you're doing sciences, you really need to be focusing on the sciences and the maths A levels. But if you're doing humanities, then you have options. You have a different, you know, set of uh, choices available to you. So it's important to know these things. Great. Well, I'm glad I answered the questions in uh, in the webinar, if not afterwards. And I thank everybody for their time. And what I would say is. You know, these are difficult times for everybody, everybody all over the world. I'm dealing with teachers, students, parents, really all over the world at the moment who are under such pressure. And many of them, like you, their schools are closed and they, some of them have got big exams coming up. Um, but don't get overwhelmed. That's my advice. We will get through this. I'm old enough to have lived through some of these things before and there will be an end to it. Um, <laughs> so keep your spirits up keep focused hopefully this has recharged you a little bit just having this time to focus on your future and keep you know just keep that vision in your head of where you want to get to and what you've got to do to get there and, and work keep working that's that's all i can say don't be don't be uh, derailed by anything that comes along like this because you you've got your whole future ahead of you that's the most important thing outstanding thank you so much Okay, thank you, Kirsten. I'm going to, are you going to end this or shall I? Um, I will end it and then that will stop the recording and then I will transfer the recording and we will see how we can put it um, for access for our community. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your help. Bye. Lovely. Bye. -bye. We'll follow up too. We want more, another one of these. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye now. Bye.